I would like to look at the rest of 1 Peter 2. It's not the same lesson. There's other things in the, in the sentence there. First Peter 2, verses 2 and 3. He said, like newborn babies, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious or that the Lord is good. And we're focusing on what it is, talking about to taste that the Lord is good. This focuses on Psalm 31 heavily. If you wish to turn there, that's a good one to have at the ready. But we have some other places to look as we talk about what it is to be good in the, in the context of the New Testament when Peter says that. Um, this word for good, when we say taste and see the Lord is good, you know, the word there is the word that typically I would render that as useful. The Lord is useful. And that's a neat thing to think about, not to say, you know, not to belittle the Lord or to, to say something that's blasphemous, but to say it's useful to serve the Lord is what it means. It's good. It's not just good. It's good for you is what it means. If you have taste, if you taste and see the Lord is good, it's taste and see the Lord is useful. It's good to serve Him. It's wholesome. It's effective. You know, something like this is the meaning. Although they do use this of, of persons when they say that a person is good using this same word, which is typically called useful. They're talking about they're good at something, like they're good at war. That would mean valiant. Or that they are a good person. That would mean honest or worthy. Something like this. So when we say taste that the Lord is good, we're saying it's useful to serve God. We're saying God is good to us and God is good for us. So we look at Psalm 31. This is clearly what Peter has in mind. In Psalm 31, you find there in the 19th and 20th verses, How great is your goodness which you laid up for those who fear you, which you prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Yes, we see there... Abundant is God's goodness. He has stored it up for those who fear him. God has a treasure house of goodness, of things that are good for us, that are wholesome, useful blessings. And he stores us in shelter, keeps us from the strife of tongues. It's true, sometimes people mistreat us for the gospel of God, but the Lord is good to us. The Lord is protection for us in Psalm 31. you see this idea that he is both doing things that we find useful, things that we can make use of, but he, and he is also providing protection. He is a shelter in time of storm. And then if we look in Titus uh, and in Ephesians in the New Testament, just to get the idea of what it is when we say, taste and see the Lord is good. What is it to be good? You know, you got two places here that, that are just useful for defining the term. But in Titus 3, it's verses 3 through 6, where we're being told to speak evil of no one, be peaceful, gentle, showing humility to everyone. Because, in Titus 3, verse 3, we ourselves were once also foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. 
through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. But you see there at Titus 3 and verse 4, it's the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared. That's when he saved us by his grace. That's the goodness of God. Have you tasted that goodness is the question from Peter. Have you left the foolish, disobedient, deceived, lusts and pleasures, malice, hate, envy, hatred? Have you left those things? Have you tasted the kindness and the goodness of the Lord? And then again at Ephesians 2, you have another passage useful for defining the kindness of God, the, the goodness of God, the usefulness of serving him, which is Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7. God, rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That Yeah, that is the, the end there. He will show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He is good. He is kind. He is calling on us to leave behind the world and the old life of sin, but not without promise. There's coming goodness, and it's immeasurable. According to Ephesians, don't forget strength in battle, protection, things that we talked about. God is good to have on your side. God is protection. So these are all the things that are in mind when you're talking about taste and see that the Lord is good. Which is Psalm 34. The Lord is good. How is he good? Well, he is good to us. He is good for us. He is protection. He is a champion. He's all these things. Look with me at Psalm 34. It is clear in the, ver the eighth verse, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And in the translation of the scriptures into Greek of Psalm 34, it's the exact same wording that Peter uses in 1 Peter 2.3. So he's quoting Psalm 34, verse 8, in the Greek translation. The Septuagint it was executed by the Jews that lived in Alexandria, somewhere around 275, 250 B.C. It's kind of amazing, actually, because, you know, Alexander the Great, who came from Philippi, Macedon. Anyway, Alexander the Great died very young, right? 32 years of age. He conquered the entire Mediterranean and all the way across northern Africa, all the way into India. He spread the Greek language everywhere. Somewhere around 315 B.C., Somewhere around 315 B.C., suddenly this northern Africa is not northern Africa. It's Alexandria, and we speak Greek here. <laughs> and a generation of Jews grows up between 315 and 275-ish B.C., and what do they do? They translate the Bible into Greek. Those guys are cool. They are our brothers those are real Jews, you see? They loved God so much. They said, ah, everybody can read this now. We're going to share it with them. And that's what they did. That's pretty neat. So that's why the New Testament quotes from it so often. They knew those are our brothers. Those are the right kind of people. They're trying to spread the word of God. But anyway, that's a whole other discussion and why they all ended up speaking Greek and how, how did he how did he do this and how did it spread everywhere? That's a whole other discussion, but it seems fairly obvious to me why that happened. 
and what the timing of that was. But Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's the quotation of 1 Peter 2, 3. Remember, if you will, when we first approached the letter of Peter, we talked about the fact that Peter is making a comparison to a child, that we're the children of God and we are growing into maturity, which started back there, for example, at 1 Peter 1, 17, if you call on God as Father, then conduct yourselves with fear. If we're calling him our father, we're saying we're children. And isn't that what Psalm 34 says in the 11th verse? Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. If you call on him as father, conduct yourselves with fear. Very clear what Peter is quoting. Also in Psalm 34, you find that 13th verse. Oops. Keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit. And yes, the vocabulary appears in 1 Peter 2, when he tells us that we put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy. It's clear that Psalm 34 is the framing reference for 1 Peter. This is where he's starting. Also, Psalm 34, verse 9, Fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. For those who fear him have no lack. Those who are his saints, his holy ones, his special people. Remember 1 Peter 2? But also, those who fear him have no lack. And of course, he spoke of the fact that God is good to us, but also in 2 Peter, in that letter in chapter 1 and verse 11, he sp as it, the culmination of growing and the, the things that build one upon another, he said, if these qualities are yours and abounding, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom. As I remember Tom Roberts pointing out, you don't crawl into heaven. There's a rich entrance. You're not saved by accident. You're not ba saved barely, squeaking by. When God saves, God saves completely. The power of God to salvation is such that you are richly provided an entrance. Those who fear him have no lack. And also I read in Psalm 34, in the 19th verse, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Yes, the righteous person does suffer mistreatment. It will happen. There will be a time when you're in trouble for nothing, just doing what is right. Speaking the truth. And God knows that. He sees that. The Lord delivers him out of them all. Maybe not right now. <laughs> Maybe not till life is over. But it's just a little while, as Peter tells us. Our short time on earth, for just a little while, if need be, we suffer various trials. And Peter also said in 1 Peter 2 that we are called to this because in 1 Peter 2, 21, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that, that you might follow in his footsteps. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And we are called to service as well. Yeah, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. You know, taste and see that the Lord is good encompasses the affliction. He knows that sometimes it is the hard thing, and sometimes we pay. You see in Acts 7 when Stephen was being stoned to death, and the heavens were opened, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the power on high, not seated. It matters to him. He sees what we're going through. He knows. 
And Christ suffered for you, leaving an example to follow in his steps. These things, I think, are undeniable. You, you can... You know, you can you can read Psalm 34 and then turn over to Peter and you realize this is the, the substance of what he's saying. It's where he's coming from. And Psalm 34 is fairly simple. That trust should be placed in God. We think perhaps as well of the place in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 10, where he said that God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with any temptation will always provide a way of escape that you may endure. God always makes it possible for you to live right. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. You know, the power to overcome sin is not yours until you are a Christian. You're thinking, oh, I want to get my life right. Well, the truth is you can't. You are not strong enough to beat the devil on your own. You need the Lord to deliver you. You need to become a Christian. Promise to God that you will serve him from now on. And then you will have the Son of God as your advocate. And then you have the promise of God that you will not be tempted beyond what you're able to withstand. He will provide the way of escape. You don't have that promise when you're not a Christian. Yes, we turn over to Hebrews chapter 6 in closing. These are the things that Peter is calling on us to do. Remember, his first letter is written to the churches that are scattered after Stephen was killed. It's one of the first letters, if not the first, either his or James. I can't tell which. If you, if you know which one, let me know. I'd like to see it because I wasn't able to figure it out. But one of those two is the first letter of the New Testament. And he calls on us to grow in Christ, but he calls on us to trust in God. You have to put your trust in Him if you want to see success in the Spirit. Hebrews 6, though, I'm drawing from the 4th through the ninth verses. He said, It's impossible for those once enlightened and having tasted the heavenly gift, and there's our word tasted from 1 Peter and from Psalm 34, who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted, again, the good word of God, the powers of the age to come. If they fall away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. They crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. The earth that drinks in the rain that comes on it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it's cultivated receives a blessing, but if it bears thorns and briars, it's rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved... We're confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we may speak in this manner. You know, there is a goodness and a severity to God. For those who obey, he is good. For those who are disobedient and unbelieving, he is severe. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. We're quoting Romans 2. But here, there's a goodness and a severity. You see... It's impossible once you have tasted that heavenly gift, once you've tasted the good word of God. If you fall away from that, oh, what do we do for you? What do we do for you? That's a very difficult problem. And there's that taste. If you know what it is to serve God and what the cost is and that the cost is worth it, and you walk away from that, what can we say that hasn't been said? You know, when people are not Christians, when they don't know God and they've never heard the Bible, or they've never read the Bible, this is their first time that they've heard this. This is the first time they've understood this. And they can turn from all kinds of things. You see, Paul, who turned from torturing the children of God, but people can turn from paganism, from Satanism, from atheism, from no, you know, whatever. But if you have tasted that the Lord is good, if you have become a Christian, if you know the Scriptures, 
and then you walk away? What can we say to you that hasn't been said? That's what he's getting at in Hebrews 6. Wow, there's nothing else but the Word. The Word is the only power. Now, that doesn't mean we can't say encouraging things and say we'd love to see you again. But there's nothing to add. The Bible is all that we need to be saved. There's nothing to add there. There's no crucifixion to be offered. There's nothing next. This is what there is. It's the only means. And that's why he said what he does in the ninth verse. Though we speak in this way, we feel sure of better things. Hold fast. Yeah, they say one man and God is a majority. That's a fun way of saying it. But really, you and the Bible, you know, God will save you. If you desire God, if you long for the pure milk of the word, God will save you. You can know the truth. If, yes, if you keep his word, then you are truly his disciple and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, John 8. You and the Bible, that's what it takes for you to hear from God and to know what God wants you to do and that's how you can be saved and that's how you can be restored to him. That you and your heart wake up because God has been gracious to you and allowed you to do so and you decide to come back and do his will again and that's encouraging to Everybody else who's there when it happens. I've been restored before, having walked away, and I know others have done this. And it's true, there's nothing else to be said. It's not that I didn't know what was right, I knew. But you have to go back to longing for the milk of the word. You have to want God. You have to want the truth, the freedom that is in Christ Jesus, and the joy that there is in that truth. Though there may be not joy in some other things. You know, a lot of things can be hard about serving him as we saw in the psalm. But he'll protect us. He'll provide for us. You can make it with the strength that God provides. Long for that milk of the word. Hold fast to it. God will save you. The Spirit says we are confident of better things. You will be richly supplied in entrance. God knows who you are. He knows where you've been, what you've been through. Today you're not a Christian, become a Christian. That you might have forgiveness of sins today, yes, and that you have the promise to overcome sins in the future because you have the Son of God on your side. We have water prepared that you might be baptized if that is today your need. Are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Repent, as we've talked about. You know what it is. Make up your mind and serve God again. But we'll pray with you because we've been there. You're not alone in your suffering, as he said in 1 Corinthians 10. It's nothing that uh, your brethren, it's nothing that, that isn't common to mankind, that your brethren in the world haven't felt this. Yeah, they have. Let's help each other. Let's build each other up. Let's come together for the better and not for the worse. Let's, let's be Christians together and help each other on to God. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing.